On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Roger and Sarah Batsimer travel through Central Florida and visit the small town of Cross Creek. There they learn about the fascinating historic homestead of best-selling writer Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, author of The Yearling. We've spent the last few nights here at the Herlong Mansion, which has looked like this for the past 100 years. It's now a delightful bed and breakfast with lovely gardens. It's located in historic Micanopy, Florida, just about 10 miles south of Gainesville. And the downtown is charming with antique stores and lots of other interesting shops. But today we're going to take a special trip out to the Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings State Park, where I'm going to do a small painting and we'll learn a little bit about its history. Author Marjorie Rawlings sums up her feelings about her home in Cross Creek in this quote, It seems to me that the earth may be borrowed but not bought. It may be used but not owned. We are tenants and not possessors, lovers and not masters. Cross Creek belongs to the wind and the rain, to the sun and the seasons, to the cosmic secrecy of seed, and beyond all to time. Well, there's a whole lot of subject matter to choose from here. I think I'll explore the main house a little bit. I think I'd like to go over to the tenant house and see what I can find. Okay. Well, we've looked all around here and there's a lot of beautiful things to paint. This barn over here and the main house, but Sarah's discovered this little tenant house and it's got some light starting to come across it. It's got a lot of character, so I think I'm gonna concentrate on this special little area here and uh, set up my easel and do a small painting. I brought my little French easel with me. It's a half easel, it takes up very little space when traveling. I brought three different sizes of masonite boards. I'm using these instead of canvas because when you're traveling, space is always an issue. So these are very thin, don't take up much space. And I have three sizes here, 11 by 14, 8 by 10, and 5 by 7 inches. Those are all standard sizes, so I can buy ready-made standard frames for these. I think this is such a special little place here today, though. I'm gonna use the larger size, 11 by 14 inches. I got my acrylic paints, my water. I think I have everything I need. As I finish setting up my equipment here, Sarah and park ranger Sheila Barnes are going to take you on a little historic tour of the interior of the main house right over here. Marjorie Canan Rawlings used this room quite a bit for writing in. And in the wintertime, she liked to set up in this corner behind you uh, with her portable typewriter from the front porch near the fireplace because it's very hard to warm up these rooms when it's cold. Yes. And what are some of her best known writings? Well, The Yearling, of course, um, won her the Pulitzer Prize in 1939. It was published in 38. So a number of movies were created from her novels. Um, what are some of the best known? The best known would have been The Yearling, starring Gregory Peck and Jane Wyman, and that came out in 1945, just after World War II ended. Uh, Cross Creek movie was produced in 1983, and that starred Mary Steenburgen as Marjorie Rawlings. And it is still very popular with our visitors. So one of her most popular uh, novels was Cross Creek. Yes, and that was also made into a movie. 
And that's about this community that she had fallen in love with. Yes, and it chronicles her day-to-day -day life here and her observations of nature. And she had quite a nice garden, didn't she? Yes, she had to have one because you couldn't just run out to the store to buy your vegetables. You had to grow your own, so she kept it an ongoing garden behind the house. Now, during the warmer months, which is most of the time here in Florida, where did she do her writing? On the front porch, on the homemade uh, table uh, there. She liked to be able to watch the redbirds come to her bird bath in the front yard under the great myrtle tree that's in bloom today. And she would hopefully get some breezes out there while she was working in, during the long, hot summers. I'd like to show you Miss Rawlings' books in the next room. That would be great. So this is the book room, and uh, oh, I see some beautiful first editions. This is uh, quite a collection. Yes, it is. Now on the middle shelf, in chronological order from left to right, are all the books Miss Rawlings wrote out there on the front porch. Huh. And you can see that the yearling is in the middle of the, the lineup, uh, that she continued to write a number of books after her success with that. I love that edition that's on display here because it's illustrated by the artist N.C. Wyeth. And it's the last book he illustrated before his death. So she was very fortunate to have him do the artwork for the second edition. He would stay here as a guest of Mrs. Rawlings' for a number of weeks while he worked on those sketches. This was such a tender story mm -hmm. that he had to bring his usual vibrance down a little. So he even used, um, instead of using uh, his normal oils, he went to gouache and tempera for these. So it's a softer image. Were there many visitors here? Once Mrs. Rawlings became famous, she would have a lot of interesting visitors come to this house. And this is the guest room where they would have stayed. Those guests would have included Robert Frost, the poet, Margaret Mitchell of Gone with the Wind fame. They had a lot in common, both Southern women writers. Thornton Wilder, A.J. Cronin stayed here. I think my favorite would have been N.C. Wyeth and, of course, Gregory Peck, who stayed during the filming of The Yearling. Even Wendell Wilkie came through here while he was campaigning for president. <laughs> and at this point in time, Miss Rawlings has gotten to know Eleanor Roosevelt, and she's invited to stay as a guest of um, Mrs. Roosevelt in the White House, where she stays in the Lincoln bedroom. And so uh, she's definitely become somewhat of a celebrity. So this is the dining room, and I understand that she was a wonderful cook. Yeah, she wrote a cookbook called Cross Creek Cookery, and it has a lot of the old-timey southern variety uh, recipes in it for collard greens and cornbread and things like that. But it also has fancier things like seafood Newburg. Uh, but so when she had company, she loved to entertain with lavish food. She even served um, a different wine with each course and sometimes as many as six courses. So you better bring an overnight bag. <laughs> One of her neighbors called her Miss Uppity because she served fried catfish on Wedgwood China. Well, it sounds like she brought a lot of elegance to the community. Yeah, nobody would have had Wedgwood China to serve their catfish on. <laughs> I'd love to see the kitchen. Okay, let's go in there. Marjorie was quite a woodsman, and I'm wondering what she brought home for dinner. Bear steak, venison, quail, turkey, wild boar. And then, of course, all the fishing and the going for frogs' legs from the lake, uh, crabs from the springs, um, blackbird pie. Sounds great. And she cooked on this stove? Yes, and it's mighty hot in the summertime, as you can well imagine. That's why there are so many windows in this particular room, to let the heat out from the wood stove. Ice box away from the heat of the wood stove out on the back porch. It's a very large capacity one. Ice was delivered here twice a week. Where did the ice come from? What big city had ice? A little town called Hawthorne, north of here by about 14 miles. And it was brought out in big 400 pound blocks, and then they would chisel off what each household wanted. A custom fit. Right. <laughs> That's neat. Well, I'm all set up, I think, and it is a hot day out here. It's 
supposed to reach 100 today, and I think it has already. Pretty bright sun, but this looks like the best location to set up to paint this. And uh, I'm excited about getting started. This is just a beautiful, sort of a severe looking landscape. So we're looking at the very side of the house. So we're not getting any perspective, but I like the shapes and designs of this. For paints, I have my titanium white, ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow, blizzard crimson, and black. I don't think I'll be using the black much, if any. If I use it at all, it'll be to make things a little bit grayer, not to make things darker. So I have three primary colors red, yellow, and blue. So that's all I'm using for colors. And I used to use at one time many, many colors on my palette, and I have nothing against that, and maybe next week I'll use all those colors again. But, but the older I get, the more simplified I like to try and make things. So we get the three primary colors. My one exception here, it's really not an exception, but I have two yellows. One is a cool yellow, and one is a warm yellow. The Indian yellow is a, is a very warm yellow, and the Cadmium yellow is a cool yellow. Now they're both warm colors, but within warm colors and cool colors, that those vary between warm and cool as well. Uh, if I put another red up here, I would put maybe uh, naphthol red or cadmium red light. I have a small variety of brushes. Basically, I have the uh, flats, a fan brush, and a couple of small pointed brushes for detail. And I've learned to keep things to a minimum, but I also learn to bring a few extra brushes with me because when I'm working with acrylics out here in the field, if I don't keep on top of things, paint can dry out in these acrylic brushes and without having some alcohol to uh, soften the bristles, uh, I don't want to get stuck without any usable brushes. So I bring a few more brushes than I actually need. As you can see, this is a white piece of masonite, but I'm going to tone this with some burnt sienna. I'm going to spray it with my atomizer, and this is another very important tool. I, I don't think I could paint anywhere without using one of these. just keeps my paint a little bit wet and keeps the paint on the palette just a little bit wet for a little bit longer. So I just sprayed that board just a little bit. have some paint on there. I'm just going to take a paper towel and tone this board. Painting in the shade is the ideal thing to do, but often when painting in the shade, especially within trees and that sort of thing, the light starts to come through and starts to make streaks of light through your painting. I'm going to start out with a large brush. I'm going to mix a few paints together. I'm just going to pick up my red, yellow, and blue to make a dark color. It's very important for me to start with big areas of the painting first. I want to get this foundation in with the big units, the big shapes. Then I work forward and uh, create the details later on. And I also like to work from dark to light. In a lot of ways that makes a lot of sense because uh, inside the plant there, in the darker areas, in the middle of the plant, it's always the darkest. And as I come out, the sun is hitting the leaves. So it's just naturally darker in the interior of that plant than it is on the exterior. And that's why I like to work from dark to light here. I can put those light colors over it. This light brown color, this sienna color, is also going to keep and maintain a nice warm tone to this painting. And all that wood underneath here looks to me to be very sort of a warm color, sort of a cool color. It's really hard to tell when things are gray, when things are white, and when the things are in shadow, it's really hard to determine what color they actually are. The key is to compare one color to another color. In other words, to compare the roof to the side, to compare the uh, color of the windows or something. So it's a whole matter of comparison through this whole painting. So now that I've established all my dark tones, I'm going to start on the middle tone value. So I'll work from dark to middle tone to light. So I'm looking at the side of that building now, and it looks rather cool to me. So I'll make this a gray, put a little bit of red in there. I don't want it too gray. Earlier on this morning, I was getting a very beautiful sort of a slice of light 
across this house. And although it doesn't exist there right now, I'm going to put it in as I remember it from when I first got here this morning. It'll sort of give me a nice place to focus my interest where this window is and where those clothes are hanging. As I look at this roof, it's a very cool color, but it's lighter than this area down here. So here again, I'm comparing these, not only the colors, but the values of things. And the ground down here seems to be about the same value as that roof. I'm just gonna lay a little bit of this gray in here. It's a very gray painting right now, but I'm going to be adding all this nice color later. Butterflies love this lantana. We've seen a few of them. So I'm gonna add a few more light values here to sort of complete the triad of light, dark, and middle tones. I don't want this to be terribly light at this point because I wanna put some nice highlights in there to finish this, but I do wanna keep it warm. Now, even though this is an historic house and all, if I feel like I need to make some changes to this, whether I need to move a window a little bit or a door or something, I'm going to go ahead and do that because my primary interest here is to create a good painting, not to create an historic representation of this. Uh, I'm not making an historic statement. I'm just trying to make a good painting. And whether it comes out to be a good painting or not, one of the nice things about painting on location like we are here is we really get the feel of this area. And this is a very special area. We learned something very interesting this morning. There are many places, tens of thousands of them, on the National Historic Register. In fact, the bed and breakfast we're staying at is on the National Historic Register. But this is a little different because the Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings State Park is a National Historic Landmark. And that's a place where significant historic events occurred or places where prominent Americans worked, or sites that represent ideas that shaped our nation. And there are fewer than 2,500 of these historic places carrying the title National Historic Landmark in the entire country. And I like that for other reasons too, is because this is such a simple, sort of humble place. It's not, you know, it's, it's not grand. So it's just nice to know to be in a place like this that's, that's so low keyed and special at the same time. There's been a lot of creative energy in this place for decades and decades, and artists are welcome to come and set up their easels like I'm doing now and paint the many subjects that are here. And there are many beautiful subjects to choose from. There's the barn over here, of course, the main house. There's a lovely garden with many little details to paint. But uh, of course, I've chosen to work on this little tenant house, but it's just a wonderful place to set up an easel and paint. Well, as I have this laid in here, I can see one major problem I've created for myself, but it's not too late to change because it's blocked in so boldly that it will only take me a few minutes to make these changes. And I noticed just now that this window is just dead center in the middle of the painting. That's not such a good idea. So I'm going to change this and just move it all over this way. Isn't that funny? I mean, some things that should be so obvious, and even though I've painted thousands of paintings, sometimes little things like this just slip by. Another big factor for me is to be willing to change my painting and to make corrections as I need them and to uh, be willing to destroy what I've already painted and spent time on. If I can make it better by taking out what I've already painted and changing it, then I'm usually willing to do that. And as far as the time investment goes, it's really not that much time. You know, as I compare the values right here, I'm looking at the side of the house and the roof and my values here are way too close. So I would either need to darken the value on the side of the house or lighten the value on the roof. This is already pretty dark. So I'm going to lighten the value here on the roof of the house. Now, since I moved that window, I need to replace the 
light that was coming across there. So again, I'll mix up a little bit of lizard and crimson, yellow, touch blue, all three primary colors. It's just amazing how many colors you can get out of just the three primary colors. One advantage of using just a few colors is I can't go too far astray from having things in harmony. It's really important to get into the right mindset when doing these paintings. Often, if there's a bad start or something like that, it's easy to sort of get out of the spirit of it. But uh, this, is, this is a great opportunity here. So I'm going to try and not pay any attention to this sun and just relish in this beauty. Just don't get to see much of this anymore in Florida, this sort of thing. It's too bad I've lost my light on the side of that house because it does change things as I look at it. So I'll have to rely on my memory here. If the values are right, the colors can be off quite a bit. If the colors are right on and the values are not right, then the painting will just not look very good. So the values in most respects are more important than getting the right colors. I think a painting in many ways has a lot of character more so than photographs often do. And I don't want to put down photographs because I also love photography. But a painting, more often than not, shows the human side of what the subject is. And it's almost through the artist's vulnerabilities and lack of skill that these feelings come out. A photograph shows everything, shows everything in detail. That's, that's the way it is. But a painting, is really so much more of an interpretation by the person doing it. And whether the artist is skilled or not skilled, those feelings come out either way. One method I often use to keep my hand steady is hand over hand method. I just put my fist here and my hand over it. I have that window frame there, but the window frame is the same value all the way around. Obviously this would have been in light and this would have been in shadow. So I need to lighten that window frame. I like the way this warm color brown, burnt sienna that I put on here is still showing through a lot of this painting. This painting would be totally different had I not added that burnt sienna at the beginning. So now I'm going to work on sort of what the painting is all about, the center of interest here. I've got my big shapes, my values, pretty much where I want them. Now I'm going to put in this little detail of the clothes and the clothesline, which should really add the kind of the human interest above the building to this painting. You know, even in all this heat, I'm still enjoying sitting here. I think once an artist gets involved in a piece of work, a lot of other things sort of fall by the wayside, like personal comfort. <laughs> I'm going to put in a few highlights here around the top of this tub, which hopefully will give me enough description of what this is. In so many ways, the details make the painting, but without these big shapes here first, the details would just really fall apart. What I need to address now are these bushes. They're too dark, but I've left them that way intentionally. Now, since they're dark, I already have the sort of the inside of the bush already figured out as far as color and value. Now I can bring out these bright leaves and uh, put some of these bright colored flowers on these lantana. I think with this small brush, I'll add a few details of leaves as they're growing up here. Kind of ignored this back here. I think I'll just put in a few patches of sunlight back there. This is full of palmettos, Washingtonian palms, cabbage palms, and oak trees. 
This is certainly just a suggestion of what's back there. So I still hear some thunder up there, so I'm gonna call it quits before we really get a heavy shower here. But I think I'm finished with this. I'm going to add a few more details in the studio, a little more detail down here under these bushes, a few more flowers maybe, define these uh, clothes on the clothesline, maybe add a little more character and texture all around the painting, but this is finished. So I've added things to this painting and I've taken things away. I've really taken this subject and just transformed it from what it is into sort of my own vision of things. But this has been a lovely place to visit, one of our favorite spots so far, the Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings State Park. We've been treated so lovely here, so it's a great place. And uh, now I'll just put a frame on this and uh, after I finish it, and we'll see what it looks like. So Marjorie was quite a marksman in a, a woods, woods hunter. <laughs> a little shower. The bright sunlight is out and it's starting to rain. And so when she put in the bathroom, that's when she got the uh, water. Um, well, that's your question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Batsimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.